Well, amen. As you're sitting down, if you'll turn with me this morning to Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 8 through 10 and see that God has saved us by His grace through faith to glorify Him in all that we do. As you're turning, flipping, or clicking, whether you're with us this morning or online, I, I was thinking this week about one of my favorite movies, and one of my favorite movies in the world is called The Princess Bride. And I don't know, okay, amen, somebody's seen it too. And and the movie's so quotable, right? But so much happens in The Princess Bride. There's pirates and princesses, and there's boat chases and sea monsters, and there's duels with both right-handed and left-handed people. And there are, you know, battles of wits to the death. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And then towards the climax, when it's time to storm the castle and finally save the princess, the main character Well, he doesn't know what's going on because he's been mostly dead all day, right? And it's difficult to know what's going on. Naturally, we give him some grace. He's been mostly dead. So one of my favorite quotes, and my wife likes to use this one quite often, the secondary character looks at the main character and says, let me explain, right? He's going to tell him everything that's going on. And then a light comes in his eyes and he's like, no, wait, it's too much. Let me sum up, right? My wife likes to use that on me. She's like, okay, Jared, can you sum up? what you're trying to say. Um, But I was thinking about that as I was reading these verses, because I think what we see in these few verses in this phrase in Ephesians chapter 2 are two really great summary sentences. One summary sentence is a a summary of Christian conversion. We've been talking and preaching about Christ-centered conversion for weeks now, and Paul has said a lot, right? But in verses eight and nine, he's gonna put it in just this beautiful sentence. But then not only are we gonna summarize where we've been, Paul in verse 10 is gonna point us to where we're going in the rest of Ephesians. He's gonna talk about, okay, because of what I've done in converting you, in saving you, the Lord says, this is what I'm calling you to. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna talk about Christian unity, Christ-centered community, how the gospel makes us people who love one another and walk together. And then not only that, we're gonna talk about Christ-centered character, how the gospel changes not just how we think and these beautiful praises and and psalms and spiritual songs that Paul has been giving us throughout Ephesians is gonna get down to the nitty gritty, right? To, To how does the gospel change how I do my job? How does the gospel change how I treat my wife and parent my children? We're gonna get into those things And beautifully, in in chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, Paul's going to sum up for us this morning. So if you don't mind, would you stand with me while we read this passage, and then I'll pray, and then we will dive into these summary statements. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Father, I am so thankful for your word. I am grateful that this morning in these summary statements, we get a beautiful picture of Christian life, that we have been saved. But like Jason already said this morning, God, you didn't just save us so that we could sit and look pretty. You have saved us and called us to good works to manifest your glory. I pray, Lord, that I, my personality could step out of the way and your, your voice could just be heard through this sermon this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The last few weeks, we've been seeing this beautiful picture of grace. I think last week about uh, Daniel Sheshi's sermon where he talked about those two huge words, but God, but God. And we talked about where we were before Christ entered into our story and how we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were, we were walking according to the, the enemy, the, the devil, not according to God's ways. And yet we were reminded, but God being rich in mercy. And, and in this in this passage today, where we actually get repetition from verse 5 of chapter 2, Paul says in, in verse 8, he, he, repeats chapter, uh, he repeats verse 5, but he gives us a little bit more. But I just want to break these verses down by some of the phrases to help us better understand. And I want to start really with those first three words, for by grace. For by grace. First of all, I want to point you to that word for because it's important in understanding how we study and read the Bible that that for means we can't disconnect this from what's just been said. So the reason we're preaching through Ephesians as a unit is because the Bible works that way. It's, it's, it works together. It's a unit. 
So four, because of everything that Paul has said previously, but then this, by grace. We, we've seen some really wonderful, wonderful pictures of what grace is in our sermons this week. But I just want to remind us, grace is the unmerited favor and kindness of God towards us. Grace is God looking at us and saying, they don't deserve my kindness, they don't deserve my mercy, but I'm gonna give it to them anyway. Grace is this concept that that it's hard for us to understand sometimes because it's such this beautiful thing of, of just, we didn't do anything to earn it. Paul's gonna remind us of that through this passage, but I want us to remember that. Sometimes we take grace for granted or we think grace is just something we write on some shiplap, you know, like shiplap, like Chip and Joanna Gaines, right, and put it up in our kitchens. Grace is the unmerited favor and kindness of God towards us. But, but this is also important for us to understand those two words by grace. Those two words distinguish our Christian faith from every other system of thought in the world, right? Right? By grace are the two words that take Christianity from the the concept of system of religion and morality into something entirely different, right? And I don't want to speak with too broad of a brush, but if we looked, right, if we looked at every other worldview, if we looked at every other system of morality and thought, what we could ultimately boil it down to is this. If you do good, good things will happen to you. If you do bad, bad things will happen to you. These two words, by grace, means that as Christians, we recognize what Daniel preached so eloquently last week. There's nothing good we can do, right? Spend five hours on an interstate like I did this weekend, and and you'll just see there's not a lot of good going on, right? Like you drive by people, they're texting, they're eating, they're watching movies and stuff, and you're like, what? Like, we're not, like, we're not good all by our own. We talked about that last week, but these two words, by grace, distinguish what we believe in and who we believe in from every other system of morality and religion. We believe in a God, not who said, here's a standard that you can never meet. Now, work hard and hopefully you can climb that ladder. We don't believe in a God who said, well, if you can just keep five, 10, 20, 100 rules, you're okay. We believe in a God who recognizes our fallen. I think of the Psalm, he remembers that we are dust. He remembers our frame and yet, He pours kindness, mercy, and love on us as his people. Christians, we talk about amazing grace. We talk about it a lot, but let's not forget that grace is what distinguishes us as something entirely different than the rest of the world. Summary statement of Christian conversion cannot start anywhere else but by grace because it's only the grace of God that even gets us to this point in the story, right? It's only the grace of God that gets us to understand what Paul has been prayerfully and I think praising the Lord for his mercy. Grace is the only thing that gets us to that. But then Paul adds something in verse eight that he didn't necessarily talk about in verse five. And I think it's important that we talk about that. For by grace you have been saved, but he adds these two words, through faith, through faith. And this, I think, sometimes is where we kind of get tripped up. Well, Paul said we can't earn our own salvation, right? We've been talking about that. Paul says it's not by our works. We'll get into that in a minute. So what is this through faith? Is it a work that I do? Well, I think what gets us tripped up and messed up is sometimes we have what I like to call a Disney World idea of faith and belief, right? A Disney World idea of faith faith and belief. And, And it's this, that if I just cross my fingers and close my eyes and hope enough, good things will happen, right? Things will turn out, right? And so it's like, you remember that song, if you wish upon a star. So I'll let Daniel, Sheshi, and Edward sing. Don't laugh too hard, okay? I won't do any more singing. If you wish upon a star, right, makes no difference who you are. Anything your heart desires will come to you, right? That's Disney World faith. If, if you are Cinderella, right, and you just cross your fingers and close your eyes and really hope, wish upon a star. But what's the problem with that? We know that's faulty logic, right? We know that stars don't grant wishes, right? I know for a fact, I, I've, I've done this experiment. I've crossed my eyes and closed my eyes, crossed my fingers and closed my eyes while my team kicks field goals, and it never works, right? They never hit the field goal. Amen. Is this what the Bible means when it talks about faith? Is God calling his people to cross their eyes and close their eye? I keep saying that wrong. Cross their fingers and close their eyes and just wish and hope, or is Paul talking about something different? 
Here's why I think we, when we think that's what the Bible means when it says faith, we think that's a work that we have to do to earn God's favor. But I think if we zoom out and understand what the Bible actually teaches about faith and belief, it helps us understand that this through, that's an important word, that this faith is the means that God uses to connect us to that grace that's been talked about. So let me give you this definition, I think, for biblical faith. I think it's more like this. Dependence and trust in the character and actions of God. Faith is dependence and trust in the character and actions of God. And so let me illustrate this for us. We understand naturally, right, that we trust those who are trustworthy and distrust those who have not proven their trust or their worthiness, right? So you're walking down the street in Avondale, maybe you're eating with the hipsters and and somebody runs up to you and they're like, hey, I don't know you, but I really need $300 in cash, right? And maybe you're somebody who's just got wads of cash, I don't know, just a name, Chad, maybe you're a Chad or somebody like that who's just got wads of cash. And, um, and you immediately give them that $300, right? No, you don't trust, you're like, get away from me, right? Or maybe you're getting out of your car, you just parked and somebody runs up and they're like, let me borrow the keys, I need to borrow your car, I'll come right back. And you're like, no, you're not borrowing my car. Or maybe you're at home and somebody knocks on the door, rings on the doorbell and says, hey, um, you look like you could use a date night out with your wife, how about I'll babysit your kids for you, right? And you're like, no. And by the way, I'm calling the police. You need to run. Like, get out of here. We don't trust those who are untrustworthy. And yet we have this idea sometimes of this, I hate to say blind, because there are elements and aspects of our Christian faith that we do not see all the realities right now with our physical eyes. But yet at the same time, what I think Paul wants us to understand, and what I would think Jesus wants us to understand, is faith is not cross your fingers, close your eyes. Faith is clearly seeing the trustworthiness of God. And the reason that this faith is a gift is because when we were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked, we could not see that God was trustworthy. We believed we were the most trustworthy. You're the prince of the power of the air. He was the most trustworthy. And so what is happening? By grace, God has opened our eyes to finally see for the first time Jesus deserves the trust of my life. Jesus, great is his faithfulness. He has not failed. He will not fail. And so Paul is saying this, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are saved by grace and it is this faith that is a, it is, it is God opening our hearts and our eyes to truly depend on him. And now here's what's good about that. That means that the amount of that faith is not based on me, right? God doesn't say, if you believe enough, if you have enough trust and faith, no. Through faith, the idea is this. If you recognize, because your heart and eyes have been opened to the gospel, if you recognize that Jesus is trustworthy, you're in. You're now dependent on Christ for your salvation. It's this recognition that, hey, by the way, I understand it's not me that saves myself. It's only God. It's us understanding if heaven isn't a gift, we're not getting in. It's, it's this, and then these next words I wanna walk through in this summary statement of Christian conversion is it's not through works. Paul says, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Sometimes I think we think of Christianity as God paying us back for what, what he owes us, for us being the ones who chose him. We're the ones who picked him. We're the ones who put our faith in him. Paul's telling us in this passage, brothers and sisters, grace is not something that you're paid for what you owed. Grace is you winning the lottery with a ticket you didn't buy, right? Grace is you winning God's eternal lottery and you didn't even go to the counter and pick up the ticket, right? This is what grace is. It's not a result of works, there's nothing you could do to earn it. And, and because there's nothing you could do to earn it, here's, here's our hope, there's nothing I can do to lose it. There's nothing I can do to earn it. It is a gift the kids this morning have a, have a present, right? They have a little present to color on and I think about presents and maybe you'll think with me about the greatest present, the greatest gift that you've ever gotten. You think of little kids who've done nothing but be bad all year, right? And we tell them about the big guy, we're like, 
Like, hey, man, if you're, if you're, you know, he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. How many kids have actually been good, right? <laughs> Not many of them, right? But we still give them the gifts, right? Like, we're just open the gifts. And I think of, like, the best gift I ever got. I went to Central Florida when I was about 16 or 17 years old to visit some friends. And they were wealthier. I grew up, my dad was a pastor. My mom was a teacher at a very small school. So I didn't know a lot of the nicer things in life. And so... Uh, the mom of this family I was visiting, she said, Jared, whatever you want to do in Central Florida tonight, I'm going to bankroll it. I'm going to pay for it, and you're going to get to do, go do it. And so being me, I was thinking, oh, this is awesome. I was like, do you guys have a Red Lobster? That would be so much fun, <laughs> right? And she's like, no, 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 Jared, you got to go bigger. You got to go bigger than Red Lobster. So first swing was a miss. So the second swing, I said, I said, okay. I said, the New York Yankees are playing the Tampa Bay Devil Rays tonight. And I said, it's Derek Jeter's last season. And it's like a bucket list thing to see Derek Jeter play baseball before he retires. And this is it, last opportunity, can we go? And she's so excited, she's so happy, she runs to her computer, she comes back, she has three tickets printed out, me and her two teenage daughters, she's gonna send to see the New York Yankees and Tampa Bay Devil Rays. And can I tell you, I didn't deserve the tickets to the game, but I for sure didn't deserve the honor of going with two teenage girls, right? I was a 16, 17 year old boy. And yet the whole way home, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, Derek Jeter got a hit. Mariano Rivera struck out the last three batters with six pitches, he got them out. And I'm thinking the whole way home, how could I ever repay this gift? of getting to see Derek Jeter, one of my heroes, play baseball before he retires. The wheels are turning in my mind right now. I'm thinking like, that's a great gift. I recognize now as an adult, it probably wasn't as big of a deal as I thought it was then. But, but I'm thinking like the whole way, bro, I could never pay this back. And I'm sure you've been given something at some point that you just know I could never pay this back. And Paul says, Christian, focus on the gospel, know this. Your salvation is not a result of works. It is a gift of God. And brothers and sisters, God delights in giving good gifts. Our salvation, this summary statement, Christian conversion, it is by grace, it is through faith, it is not through works. It is a gift beyond repayment. Amen, that's good news, isn't it? The gospel's good news. If you're wondering, how can I learn how to share my faith? I I would tell people, just man, memorize Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. That's a great place to start, knowing the gospel. When somebody says, what is it that you as Christians believe? You can tell them, well, here's what we believe. So that's awesome news. It's great. We could get Russell and Josh to come start singing right now. That song said, I love that lyric, a thousand words, right? A thousand years would never be enough. And it wouldn't. But notice this, Paul doesn't stop at verse 9. Paul can stop right there, right? You've been saved by grace through faith. This is awesome. Just go sit in your churches, be comfortable, be happy, right? That's what he says, Jesse. No, that's not what he says. He says for. There's a reason. There's a reason that God has saved us to display his glory. How do we do that through good works? So let's read verse 10. And in verse 10, what I want you to see is a summary statement of Christian character. This is going to thrust us into who we are and how we live in just one summary statement. So verse 10 says this, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Oh man, this is so good. So the first part of that, like just think of this, not only does Paul say that we don't work to earn our salvation, in fact, we're not even the worker, we're the thing being worked on, right? We're the workmanship, right? We're not the one building, we're the building being put together. We're not the toddler, we're the Legos, right? Think of that. The reality is that we are a new creation, Paul says, we are created in Christ Jesus. This distinguishes us from the rest of creation, right? For everything we know has been created. All other people that you know were created by God. All other things that you see were created by God. But Paul says this is different. This is a distinction. And what is the distinction? The distinction is we were created in Christ Jesus. And and because we're created in Christ Jesus, that's a couple of things. Number one, it distinguishes us. But then number two, it's the security that we have. If you wrestle with assurance, if you wrestle with, am am I truly, is this really about me, 
Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, then know this, it's, it's rooted in the fact that it is Jesus the worker and not your work. And if, if you have faith, that means you recognize it's, it's just depending on Christ, but we are created in Christ Jesus. And our position in Christ is the guarantee that the work will be finished. God does not start projects that he doesn't finish. And we are the workmanship, a new creation, distinct from the rest of creation. And in at least this way, the rest of creation displays the glory of God, manifests the glory of God, but it often does it silently, right? We think of the Psalms, the heavens declare the glory of God, but the heavens like talk about wishing upon a star. They're, they don't open mouths and speak. But we are a new creation and, and for good works. And those good works at least include this, that we open our mouths and declare the glory of God in everything that we do. We are created as a new creation in Christ Jesus. And then this, for good works. A lot of times we get tripped up when we come to good works in the Bible. And a lot of that, there's some historical things in, in our stream of Christianity where we, we wanted people to understand that by grace through faith, so importantly in Christ alone, grace alone, we want people to understand that so well that sometimes it makes us nervous when the Bible brings up good works, right? Because <laughs> we don't want people to be confused. We don't want them to think, oh, you have to do good works to be a Christian. Eh, that sounds bad. So we just always directly point the by grace, by grace, by grace. And that's great, except Paul doesn't stop in verse nine, right? He continues. And so I just wanna, as, as clearly as I can say, I think we need to understand the difference of works and faith is a different of position, right? So works are not the cause of our salvation, but they are the result of our salvation. So understand this, if you are in Christ, Ephesians says in Christ so many times, if you are in Christ, you should expect good works, not to save you, but because you are saved. And think about it like this. If God is the one working, creating, and we are his workmanship, his workmanship should shine through us, right? And, and so we should be doing the works, the things that he does, the love that he has, the care for, that he has for other people, right? So we are, in fact, created for good works. And what I want you to see is something freeing, completely freeing, as I was reading and studying this passage, which God prepared beforehand. That's good news. And let me tell you why, right? Husbands, let me just have your attention for a minute. Have you ever been like your wife runs through the living room and you're there, you're reading, you know, you're reading some deep Aristotle or something. That's what you guys are doing, right? Yeah, no, okay, me either. I'm like on my phone. My wife walks in and she says something along the lines of like, I've spent an hour in the kitchen preparing food, right? But all you have to do, it's in the fridge, just take it out, put it in the oven, let it bake for 350 for 30 minutes, we'll pull it out, I'll be back for dinner and we'll eat, right? That's something that's happened to you before, it happens to me quite frequently. And then what happens when your family gathers around the table, you start bragging to your kids and you're texting your friends that like, look at this dinner that I cooked, right? And your wife's looking at you like, are you serious? Like, you're boasting. You, all you did was follow through what was already started. Man, think about this. Think about this this morning. Brothers and sisters, God has prepared beforehand the good works for us to walk in. All we're doing is following through on what he already started. Is that not good this morning? That was helpful to me because I don't know about you, and we're going to get back to this in a minute when we talk about application, but I spend probably hours thinking, God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to serve? I know I'm called to good works, but what do, what do I do? What if Paul is telling us we are called to walk in good works that before the foundation of the world were already written out, were already set down, and so... So we're going to talk about in just a moment what that looks like, hopefully, practically. So pause there, and I want to kind of pull it all together with, with this idea of responding to the gospel. How do, we re how do we respond to these two summary statements? And I think there are probably a lot of applications we could make here, but I want to make two this morning for us specifically at Tapestry Church. Number one is this, we celebrate the gift and glorify the giver. We celebrate the gift and glorify the giver. I, I was thinking about this this week. What you celebrate speaks to who you are, right? 
what you celebrate speaks to who you are. When Jason was up here celebrating this young man that he's invested in for the glory of God, not to make a big name, but you see his passion, don't you? And, and in fact, if you come to my house, and this may tell you a lot about, if you come to my house in the fall, I think actually Jamie Pridemore is scarred for life because he watched the Alabama LSU game with me last year, right? Because what I celebrate says a lot about what I love and who I am. So let me ask us this, believers, in, a, in an encouraging way, not a guilty way, but an encouraging way, are we celebrating and glorifying the gift that God has given us and the giver of those gifts? Are people aware of who we are in Christ because they see who and what we celebrate? And if not, what do we do? Well, I think the answer is this. We evaluate, and this is, this is a long process of sanctification throughout our lives. We're not gonna get it right every time. None of us are gonna be perfect at it, but it's this process of hearing the word, having the spirit, and then evaluating where we are. And so we evaluate, what am I celebrating? And am I celebrating this gift of grace that's been given to me and the God who has given it to me? Tapestry Church, my prayer is that we would be made up of individuals who are constantly and consistently celebrating the gift that God's given us and celebrating the giver. But not only that, I pray that as a church family, we are known as joyful, celebratory people. That we are known as a church that if you go to church with those people, they're gonna celebrate the gospel. And they're gonna celebrate the God who has made the gospel good news for us. Brothers and sisters, it's easy to say we'll celebrate, but we need to celebrate in the midst of circumstances. And I know that's difficult. I don't want you to think what I'm saying is you just always have to have a smiley face and the situations and circumstances of your life aren't real or trying to minimize those. No, those are real. But here is the Christian distinction from the rest of the world. We do not mourn like those who have no hope. When we mourn because the world has been shifted and shut down and it's not the same as it was, we still mourn. Yes, we recognize the pain and the things we're walking through, and yet we still celebrate the eternal gift of God that's been given to us. I wholeheartedly believe that if God's people right now in the midst of our circumstances of this world would be people who celebrate and glorify God for the gift that he's given us, we would stand out keep thinking about that illustration, the ring against the black felt. Part of that manifesting the glory of God, showing the glory of God to other people is that we always make a big deal out of who God is and what he's done. Remember that what you celebrate, what you get excited about and talk about, it's easy for me to do about like, my wife this morning, she was telling me like, Jared, we gotta get ready to go to church. I'm talking about this audio book I listened. She's like, Jared, we gotta, we gotta get ready and go to church. What if, what if my tone was just a constant celebration that by grace, through faith, and not through my works, I have been saved? So application number one, celebrate the gift and glorify the giver. And then number two, I told you we get back to this, commit to walk in good works. I think about the freedom of verse 10, but then I think for some of us, we say, oh, Jared, that sounds great. And I'm right there with you. That sounds great, right? Colossians, where Paul says, in whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That sounds so good, but what does it look like in my real life, right? Like some people are, they're like, oh, I love that. It sounds so good. I'm good. And then like other people are over here and they're like, no, I need you, Jared, to not say that. I need you to say A, B, C, D, E. This is what I need to do. The problem is that there's tension in those things. There's tension between those two things, right? I could tell you, well, you could read your Bible, go to church, do those things that have been said for a long time, but then you get caught into this legalism, right? This, oh, these are the things I have to do to have God's favor, right? And yet, there's, there's a danger in being over here without things because you're just so, you're so busy praising the Lord and singing all the time that you've never done any good works, right? You, you say, I don't, what do I do? And so let me help us here. Number one, let me just say this. There is freedom in knowing that for each of us as individuals, there are good works prepared beforehand. So whether you're a banker or a teacher or a nurse or a doctor or the CEO or a preacher or an eye doctor, whatever you are, 
I believe the New Testament teaches that God has specifically, as a Christian, equipped you and called you to find the good works with the skills, talents, and abilities that you have and to do them. So that takes at least two things. That takes at least, number one, intentionally seeing what needs to be done, right? Intentionally looking out for the kinds of things that the New Testament says are good works. And what I love, the reason this is a summary statement of what's to come is that Paul's gonna tell us some of the good works, at least. He's gonna tell us, hey, Christian unity and love, there's a good work you ought to be about. He's gonna tell us, hey, husbands loving your wife like Jesus loved the church and laying your your life down for her, that's a good work that you've been called to. Parents, admonishing your children in the Lord is a good work that you've been called to. And so it's this danger. I could be so specific for each of us. Uh, Okay, here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do. But I may miss what God has prepared for you. But let me at least encourage you in this. Look for the good works that you're equipped and called to do. Let me tell you, that's a process too. You may not wake up tomorrow morning and like there's a writing outside your wall like this is what you need to do this, give to this, do that. But as you passionately pursue opening your eyes, opening your heart and praying to the Lord, Lord, I believe you have prepared good works beforehand for me to walk in. Would you reveal those to me? I am confident that he will reveal those to you. Maybe not immediately, but over the course of your sanctification, over the course of your life, here's the beauty. We talk about a tapestry. We talk about the front being beautiful and the back being the mess that makes it all happen. The Lord is the one putting the threads together. And at the end of the story, as was already mentioned in sermons before, at the end of the story, we're gonna see that as Christians, God was working through us in ways we didn't even have any clue about. Just by every day, a hundred million tiny decisions of faithfulness, led, spurred by the Spirit of God, spurred on by one another from Hebrews. I love that because we know he is faithful He can be trusted. I can walk in good works. So let's respond this morning by celebrating the gift, glorifying the giver. But this, as individuals and as a church, to commit to walk in good works, we want to be balanced. We don't want to be a church that spends so much time celebrating that we fail to be a church that serves. But we also don't want to be a church that overemphasizes serving to the point of legalism that serving equals Celebrating, We want the balance of worship. I love the definition you gave us this morning, Russell. Worship mixed with service, mixed with humble submission to who God is and faithfulness and the love that we have because of this gospel he's given us, that we would be a church committed to walking in good works. God has saved us by grace through faith to glorify him in all that we do. I'm gonna ask the praise team to come back now. I'm just gonna read Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through 10. And then as they're coming down, I'll be done. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lord, would you make Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through 10 a reality? Thank you for summarizing the gospel. Thank you for summarizing how we've been called to good works, but you've prepared the good works beforehand. Lord, make us people who celebrate the gift glorify the giver, and commit to walking in good works. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.